explores the life and legacy of this legendary Latina who is joining us for this and who has broken barriers for more than six decades, beginning her work advocating for farm workers' rights in the 1960s and 1970s, when many of you in this room were not even a glimmer in your parents' eyes. So we are thrilled to be the first venue for this exciting new exhibition. And on behalf of the board and the staff, we want to thank the Smithsonian for the opportunity to be the first on the national tour, which is just amazing. So we're one exhibition going on, right? And those of you who are coming in, make yourself at home. We're a family in here. Come on. No. <laughs> um, this is one of 35 to 40 traveling exhibitions at all time. And so to tell you a little bit more about that and about the honor that we're having being the first, I'd like to invite to you Miriam Springle, who is the director of the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service and the affiliations. So welcome, and let's hear more about this remarkable endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, as she said, my name is Miriam Springle, and I'm the director of the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service and Smithsonian Affiliations. The two Smithsonian offices I have the pleasure of directing are responsible for our national presence and for collaborations with museums and museum-like organizations around the country. The Traveling Exhibition Service, or as we're often known, CITES, is one of the Smithsonian's ambassadors bringing exhibitions and experiences to people across the nation. We are delighted to be here in Sacramento and to have the opportunity to recognize the invaluable contributions of Dolores Huerta and the bilingual exhibition, Dolores Huerta, Revolution in the Fields, Revolucion en los Campos. Exhibitions like Revolution in the Fields allow us to share the infinite richness of American history in the most inclusive ways. At SITES, we are honored to collaborate with the National Portrait Gallery and the Smithsonian Latino Center to travel this exhibition, which explores the public life of Dolores Huerta as an activist and co-founder of the United Farm Workers Union and what led her to become a Latina civil rights icon. Dolores Huerta, Revolution in the Field, Revolucion en los Campos, exemplifies the Smithsonian's ability to illuminate the American experience. As the exhibition travels the country, visitors will broaden their understanding of the farm workers' movement through a careful look at Dolores Huerta's significant, but often under-acknowledged, contributions. The exhibition will explore how workers of different ethnic and racial backgrounds came together to empower the movement and how the arts played an essential role. In addition, visitors will come to understand Huerta's far-reaching impact and important legacy. I also encourage you to check out the Dolores Huerta Revolution in the Field, Revolucion en los Campos mobile tour app featuring interviews with Huerta and a short documentary video. You can download it on the App Store or Google Play. And I understand that here you want to download it while you're downstairs and not up in the gallery because you'll, once it's in on your phone, you can look at it in the gallery. And there's just some wonderful snippets of recent interviews with Dolores Huerta. My colleagues and I are honored that the exhibition begins its national tour here at the California Museum. Sacramento has long been home to a large community of Latina and Latino labor and civil rights activists. For many years, the California Museum has shared meaningful experiences that reflect on history, the collective memory, and the local identity of this city, and has been a leader in recognizing women's roles in history. The museum has developed a wonderful slate of public activities such as those happening today that will help share the compelling story of Dolores Huerta and the farm workers movement in the 1960s and 1970s. The Smithsonian recently launched the American Women's History Initiative to tell a more complete American story and empower future generations. 
I invite you to join us to explore and amplify women's voices with, and the name of the project is hashtag because of her story. And of course, today we are here because of her story. As part of the initiative, and as we celebrate Women's History Month, we recognize an extraordinary woman. Her unparalleled leadership skills helped dramatically improve the lives of farm workers and of all of us. Dolores Huerta's invaluable contributions to the modern agricultural workers movement are deeply entwined with the history of the nation. We hope that this exhibition and its programming will continue to enrich this community and communities across the country for a long time to come. Enjoy today's presentation and enjoy the wonderful, wonderful installation that the California Museum has done upstairs, augmenting the exhibition that was developed at the Smithsonian with all kinds of objects, prints, posters, photographs from California collections. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Miriam. So our presenter today is quite a dynamo. Uh, she is the curator of painting and sculpture and the curator of Latino art and history at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, which I find amazing. Since 2013, Dr. Caragol has led the National Portrait Gallery's effort to increase the representation of Latino historical figures and artists. So because of her work, she has added more than 170 portraits to the collection. She's curated exhibitions including One Life, Dolores Huerta, back in 2015, and that serves as the basis of the traveling exhibition debuting here today, which as we know is called Dolores Huerta, Revolution in the Fields, Revolución en los Campos. And we're about to learn all about it with this afternoon's presentation. Dr. Caragol earned her PhD at the Graduate Center of the City of University of New York. Before joining the Smithsonian, she was the Curator of Education at Museo de Arte de Ponce in Puerto Rico, Latin American biographer at the Museum of Modern Art, and a researcher at the University of Essex in England. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Taina Caragol. everyone. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Um, good afternoon as well to everyone who is uh, listening to this and looking at us uh, through the live webcast, uh, wherever they might be, friends and family. Um, I'd like to give a special welcome to the veterans of the farm workers movement and the Chicano movement that are with us here today. Because, as Dina said, I was one of those people who were not even a glimmer in the, eye, uh, in the eyes of my parents. They were probably not married yet when it was all happening. <laughs> but I am in awe of their work, of their, of their cultural production, and um, I would like to acknowledge them. I have so many thank yous to give. So first, Thank you all for being here to celebrate with us the opening of the exhibition Dolores Huerta, Revolution in the Fields, Dolores Huerta, Revolución en los Campos, organized by the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service and based on the exhibition One Life, Dolores Huerta, which I curated at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery in 2015. We are sincerely and deeply grateful to the California Museum and its executive director, Amanda Meeker, for being the first host venue of this historic exhibition. Thanks also to Brenna Hamilton, Ron Rohovit, and to the museum's whole team 
for the collaboration through the process of planning the show here and making, it, and making sure it was wonderfully complemented with elements that relate to Sacramento and its connection to the farm workers movement and to the, to the life of Dolores Huerta. I would also like to give a special thanks to Miriam Springle, director of SITES, and to Catherine Kreil, assistant director of exhibitions, for supporting this project. And thanks to Maria del Carmen Cosu, project director for Latino initiatives at SITES, who believed in this project from the very beginning and spearheaded its realization with a wonderful team, including Arlene Irizarri, Tiffany Cheng, Teresa Jonis, Joanna Shadid, Eliski, Pati Artiaga, Julia Fernandez, Cristina Saar, Cristina Hernandez, Salma Catalan, and interns Cindy Monge and Douglas Ventura. The Smithsonian Latino Center, through its Latino Initiatives Pool, provided crucial federal funds to support this exhibition. We are deeply grateful to them as well. Gracias, Eduardo Diaz and Diana Bosa. As this exhibition is based on an earlier show in 2015 at the Portrait Gallery, I would like to personally thank our director at the Portrait Gallery, Kim Sayet, for believing this show deserved a national platform like ours. And also to Claire Kelly, Marlene Harrison, and Brandon Fortune for their help in the process of transforming this show into a sites exhibition. Thanks also to Wayne State University and the dedicated staff of the Walter P. Ruther Library and Archives of Labor and Urban Affairs, which lent us many important documents and photographs for the original show and many of the ones you see upstairs reproduced in this version of the show. Thanks also to the many artists who authorized us to use their images in the show. Today we have in the audience, perhaps, or maybe he's upstairs, Paul Richards, whose father, Harvey Wilson Richards, took that iconic photograph of Dolores Huerta with the Huelga sign. Paul was generous to allow us to make this image into the graphic identity of the show twice. And he also produced a short film, Hasta Sacramento, 1966, that is part of the exhibition made and made from footage taken by his father at the very entrance of the show upstairs. Thanks to the Dolores Huerta Foundation, of course, particularly to Lori de Leon and to Juanita and Camila Chavez, as well as to Jess Contreras and Mary McCartney for their help in providing photographs, documents, and anecdotes for this show and helping us understand Huerta's work then and now. We are also grateful to Dr. Nora Navarrete Dominguez, director of Laverne University Kern County Campus, and to the Bakersfield Music Hall of Fame, who helped us on a visit to interview Dolores for the application for the, for the mobile app of the show. Artist Barbara Carrasco, who is not here today, but has, one, has a, a, her wonderful, iconic silk screen of Dolores representing uh, her work in the show, also supported this project in profound ways, opening so many doors since the beginning. And most importantly, thanks, gracias, to Dolores Huerta for giving us the occasion to gather today, admiring your purpose, your strategy, and tenacity in the struggle for human and labor rights, alongside Cesar Chavez. You are a great example and inspiration for us and for generations to come. It is so meaningful to open this exhibition here in Sacramento. This city is central to the farm workers movement and to the story of Dolores Huerta. It was here that Dolores developed her talents as a lobbyist after she joined Fred Ross Sr., founder of the Community Service Organization, one of the first organizations in the country to advocate for Latino empowerment. Before founding the National Agricultural Labor Association with Cesar Chavez in 1962, Dolores Huerta lobbied here successfully in the mid-1950s on behalf of CSO to provide Spanish language voting ballots and driver's tests for migrant workers, among other initiatives. Those skills became integral to Huerta's historical contributions year later to the United Farm Workers. Sacramento State Capitol is also the place where the farm workers movement earned national attention after Chavez and Huerta addressed a crowd of 10,000 farm workers and their supporters on Easter Sunday of 1966 
at the end of the historic 300-mile march launched 25 days earlier by 77 Filipino, Mexican, and Mexican-American farm workers walking from Delano through 33 towns north, gathering massive support until arriving here. Last but not least, I am proud that this show is opening here because this is the home of the Royal Chicano Air Force. <laughs> whose artistic production since 1969 is emblematic of the inseparable cultural, social, and political impetus of the farm workers movement and the Chicano movement. The RCAF members and relatives here, please raise your hand or stand up. I would like to acknowledge you. We are very happy to see much of your original work on display supplementing this exhibition. So what I thought I would do today is to tell you about the genesis of this project, which has been many years in the making and has had several phases. For me, that project started in, the late, in late 2013. I was new at my job. I had been there for four months or something like that. And um, I was new at my job as curator of Latino, Latina, what they call now Latinx, Art and History at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. Have any of you been there? Oh, wonderful, so many of you, excellent. Well, please come back, and those who have not been, we would love to see you there. Um, the National Portrait Gallery is one of the Smithsonian's 19 museums. It's a museum that combines art, biography, and national history. Its primary mission is to tell the story of the United States through portraits of people who have shaped American history. Although by training I'm an art historian, at my institution, in my capacity as a curator, I do exhibitions, I curate shows that are sometimes anchored in art history and at other times just in history. Many of our exhibitions capitalize on historical anniversaries and they are, as they are always a good time to commemorate events and reflect upon them and they also draw history buffs. Such is the case of our annual exhibition series, One Life, a condensed biographic exhibition exploring the lives of individuals who have made history. I had just been hired by my museum when its leadership realized that the 50th anniversary of the Delano Grape Strike was coming up in 2015, two years from then. My director called me up and said, hey, can you come up with a proposal for a show to commemorate the Delano Grape Strike? And so I started thinking and researching. I wanted to take the opportunity to do something new. The main figure associated with the farm workers movement is, of course, Cesar Chavez, president of the UFW from 1966, on its creation uh, through the merging of the of AWOC, the Filipino Union and the National Farm Workers Association, until his demise in 1993. Many shows, books, and films have been made documenting his work and celebrating his legacy. We could certainly do a show on him. However, I was intrigued by the figure of Dolores Huerta. I did not know much about her, about her role in the farm workers movement at the time. But the sporadic mention of her name in accounts of the movement suggested she had been a very important figure. You just feel these things. But I have to say the mention was quite sporadic. Nonetheless, through superficial research, it was a lot easier to find mentions of her work nowadays with her foundation than with the UFW. Remember, this is, of course, before the film by Peter Brad that you will see later this afternoon, which is phenomenal. Then I found Mario T. Garcia's Dolores Huerta Reader, a wonderful book and collection of essays around Dolores Huerta, and a number of scattered sources that started to give me a sense of a woman who seemed to be doing it all picketing, communicating, lobbying, strategizing, all while raising children. Next question, in order to decide whether we could do an exhibition on Dolores Huerta was, are there enough visual materials to tell her story? I'm sorry, this had to happen. This is always my problem. I, I talk for 25 minutes and then I show you an image. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Okay, yes. So, as I was saying, you know, when you're thinking about curating an exhibition, you need images, you need, you need 
a visual story, a visual narrative. So the question was, are there enough images to tell her story? To answer that question, I traveled to Wayne State University in Detroit to visit the Wayne P. Ruther Li Library Ar and Archives of Labor and Urban Affairs, which holds the papers of the UFW and many other unions. This trip happened coincidentally exactly five years ago in March 2014. I spent two days in the archive, pouring through correspondence between the leadership of the UFW, agribusiness leaders, supporting clergy and students, reading through contract terms for fields in the Central Valley, admiring boycott flyers, and looking at hundreds of photographs of the movement, many of which featured Huerta front and center on her own and side by side with Cesar Chavez or Larry Idlion or Robert Kennedy, leading the unions every day at a micro and at a macro level, picketing, speaking at podiums and at backyards as well, meeting labor leaders, negotiating contracts, participating in town hall meetings along, along with her young children. And this is only a sample of what I saw. This is just such a fraction. And, and of course, you'll get a sense of that if you go see the exhibition. The answer to my question was right there. Of course there, was, there were enough visual materials, there was enough visual evidence of Huerta's contributions, plenty of it. The question was, why is this woman not known to every American? Why has an exhibition on her not been already curated? The issue of possibility turned into one of urgency. A show on Dolores Huerta was overdue. It was time to explore in depth her key contributions to the farm workers movement, of which she was co-architect, according to Chavez himself. It was time to acknowledge publicly, nationally, her essential contributions to American labor rights, civil rights, and women's rights. And I have to say that just a month after my visit to Wayne State University um, in April of 2014, the Plaza de la Cultura in Los Angeles uh, wonderful historical museum did the first comprehensive exhibition on Dolores Huerta and they were, it was a beautiful show, um, it included lots of art from the movement as well and I visited with them and they were very nice and collegial and we exchanged notes on our research. It was um, a really important research visit for me in preparing Dolores Huerta's show. So in t July 2015, 13 months later or so, the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery inaugurated One Life Dolores Huerta in commemoration of the Delano Grape Strike launched on September 1965 by the Filipino Agricultural Work Organizing Committee led by Larry Idlion and the mainly Mexican and Mexican-American National Farm Workers Association led by Chavez and Huerta. Both unions merged a year later under the name United Farm Workers. The UFW fought for fair wages and basic humane working conditions for California farm workers. Eventually, it spread nationally. Although the state was and is still the agricultural powerhouse of the country, farm workers lived in extreme precariousness. In the 1960s, when the minimum wage in California was 125 per hour, Farm workers were paid between 75 cents and $1 an hour and worked 10 to 14 hour days, six or seven days a week. Child labor was rampant. In the fields, there was no cold drinking water, no shelter from the sun, no bathrooms. Workers had to migrate from harvest to harvest, living in the derelict housing provided by growers, which they had to vacate when the harvest was over. They were sprayed with pesticides continuously and without warning. All of these resulted in farm workers having a life expectancy of 49 years when the national average was 75. One Life Dolores Huerta provided a panoramic view of the emergence and height of the farm workers movement from the founding of the NFWA by Chavez and Huerta in 1962 to the movement's climax in 1975 with the signing of the California Agricultural Labor Relations Act the first bill in the country that recognized the right of farm workers to unionize and bargain their contracts. And actually, the bill is upstairs. Uh, it's fantastic that the museum was able to get the, the actual document um, and exhibit it right next to the exhibition. 
Um, the show also addressed the crucial years of the grapes boycott when consumers nationally and internationally understood the human cost of the produce they ate at home and stopped buying grapes and then lettuce and gallo wine and strawberries and lemons in support of La Causa, the cause of farm workers. Through this chronological arc, the exhibition highlighted Dolores Huerta's instrumental role in the movement and the many hats she wore in her role as the union vice president. Huerta was the movement. It was her mission. Equipped with a college education, a gift for words that earned her the nickname Siete Lenguas from her grandfather, and a great sense of moral responsibility to help others. Huerta's functions in the UFW were multifaceted, including picket captain, public relations officer, communicating to the printed media, radio, and TV, lobbyist at the state and federal level, and boycott strategist. She was also the first woman to negotiate contracts on behalf of a farm workers union in the country. At the negotiating table, table she was unyielding. Growers called her the dragon lady, admirers la pasionaria. Aside from all this, Huerta set her own standards to live her life without conforming to the traditional paradigm set for Mexican American women of her time. She had 11 children and took them on the road to protests. She enlisted their efforts to help the union and sometimes left them under the care of friends and family for months to do the union's work. She left a middle class existence behind, opting instead to live on a meager salary of $5 a week and relying on the union's food bank and cloth donations for her children and her. For her social commitment and independent spirit, she was the role model for young Chicanas and eventually the mainstream American feminist movement recognized her. The exhibition also addressed the sacrifices Huerta made and the price she paid for, the, for her struggle. Over a do, two dozen arrests and a severe police beating at the age of 58, where she ended with a broken spleen and several ribs fractured. But nothing happened for, happens fortuitously for Huerta. This brutality incident led to the revising of crowd control policies of the San Francisco Police Department. Closing the exhibition were the iconic silk screen portrait Dolores, made by Chicana artist Barbara Carrasco, who joined the UFW as a volunteer artist in the 1970s and served the union for decades. We also included the Presidential Medal of Freedom given to Huerta in 2012 by pres former President Barack Obama. One Life Dolores Huerta was comprised of rare original documents and artworks that could not travel because of their fragility. So Sides redesigned the show as a freestanding graphic exhibition. We took the opportunity to go into more depth in certain aspects of the movement and of Huerta's life. We enhanced the show with additional images, including some of Huerta's childhood and youth. We also added a section on the impact of farm workers, of the farm workers movement in the arts and vice versa, including photographs of Luis Valdez's Teatro Campesino. We also documented in more depth the contribution of Filipino farm workers to the movement and the many achievements of the UFW to better the lives of their constituency, such as the creation of the first credit union for farm workers and the construction of health clinics. As you have heard from Miriam Springle, um, we also created a mobile app, which is a wonderful tool to complement the exhibition. And in it, as you go through the show, you can hear Huerta herself elaborating on each aspect um, that coincides with the numbered icon. The new exhibition also includes a community engagement resource for facilitated dialogue around issues of leadership, activism, and social justice. Both shows, the original and this new version, are bilingual in Spanish and English which is also a testament to Dolores Huerta's impact in our multicultural society and to the commitment of Smithsonian and uh, of Sites and the National Portrait Gallery to reach out to Spanish-speaking audiences. And now is your turn to see the exhibition, our turn really to reflect on it and take inspiration from Dolores Huerta's legacy of social struggle. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. If you have seen the show already, or if you haven't, if you want to know um, 
some of the differences between the first iteration and this one. Yes. to the traveling status? Like, um, are there 100 presented a year and two make it, or how does that work? Well, that is really a question that the Smithsonian Traveling Exhibition Service can answer better than, than I could. Okay. I, because I am a curator at the National Portrait Gallery, and I collaborated with my colleague, Maria del Carmen Cosu, who really spearheaded this project and enlisted uh, an army of, of, of wonderful staff, interns, uh, contractors who helped us get the rights to reproduce the photographs, um, develop the app. Uh, we traveled to Bakersfield to interview uh, Dolores for several, several days in 2016. Um, but I don't know um, how it works in terms of, of what shows you decide to tour I, I can say, I can add a few words. Okay. This is Miriam Springle. I'm with a, the director at the Traveling Exhibition Service. And let me, just, um, let me just say that we look at a lot of exhibition proposals every year. We do exhibitions that are in collaboration with our colleagues at the Smithsonian, as well as in collaboration with other organizations around the country. We have about 35 exhibitions on the road at any one time. Um, and we are basically looking for exhibitions that tell a significant national story and that will resonate across the country where there are opportunities, as you see upstairs here, done in extraordinarily um, profound ways for the community, the city that the exhibition is going to, to use that exhibition as a backdrop for telling the story that's right here. So. Um, we're looking for major national stories, and of course, this is a major national story. And as Tanya explained so well, one that's just not known, um, but it is known in certain parts of the country. And what we're hoping, as we see here at the, the California Museum, is that by bringing out objects that reside in collections across the country, we will draw attention to Dolores Huerta's amazing contributions to the nation. So, while you have a microphone, will the show that's upstairs be going to Stockton? Yes, it is this exact exhibition that goes to the Hagley Museum in Stockton. It's going to be here for three months, and then it goes to 12 other cities. Right, but if I can add, what, what we hope um, what we would like to happen at each venue is that each of them really personalize the exhibition to include the local connection to the story of the farm workers movement, to the story of the Chicano movement, to the story of Dolores Huerta. Um, there are many, many significant connections to make in California and, and through the Southwest and beyond, beyond really, because if you think about the Grapes Boycott, it was really national and international. So we would love to see those connections and it will be beautiful because every time the show travels from institution to institution, it will be slightly different. It will be transformed and it will be really uh, a slightly different story. Um, that's why uh, we made the effort. Thank you. I'm Maria del Carmen Cosu from the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service. And I am honored and humbled to be able to work with Taina, Dolores, Lori, and the team at SITES, and many of our interns and fellows like Cristina Sar, who's here today, who helped us to bring this story um, in, as a traveling format. But one of the things that we made an effort, it was to hear Dolores' voice. So the app that we were able to create, you will hear the story of Dolores from her own voice, and I think that's very powerful. And also the, com the local components, as Taina has said, as well as Miriam, are very powerful. Uh, and, and we are working here with the team at, at, at the Hagen Museum in Stockton for the next opening in August. So. Very humbled to be working with all of you. And thanks, Taina, for your leadership and your research that opened doors for us to bring the, 
the show to all of you. Thank you. Uh, actually, I'd like to add to that. My name is Lori. I'm with the Dolores Huerta Foundation. So it won't be, as she said, the exact same exhibit. The Smithsonian's exhibit, the, the core of it, you know, will be the, you know, the exhibit with the app. But on this exhibit, you know, the Dolores Huerta Foundation and our personal family um, uh, collections have been added to it. But as uh, Dr. Caracol says that as it goes from different city to city, and as you know, so there's so many people, so many strikes and huelgas and boycotts from you know California to Texas to Florida. That you know, we hope that um, the exhibit, the Smithsonian exhibit, um, the traveling exhibit itself, will be um, that there'll, there'll be more added uh, different artifacts that can you know accompany it. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could, um, well, one, thank you all for this beautiful exhibit. Um, I was wondering if you could um, elaborate more on the educational opportunities for teachers or youth to engage um, in this exhibit, um, even maybe before it comes to their local community. Sure. Perhaps that's a question also that should be answered by Maria del Carmen Cosu, because she was completely invested in, in creating the teacher's guide. I think, you know, this is, a, this is such a, this a, it's a collaborative work. There should be many people up here <laughs> um, so, answering these questions. My training is um, as a museum educator, I'm very happy to be working on developing um, activities that complement the exhibition. Uh, first, we collaborated with the International uh, Coalition for the Sites of Conscious. We created a community engage engagement resource guide in Spanish and English that um, has um, activities to facilitate dialogue within the communities. And thanks to the advice from Ron Rohovit, our education director here in Sacramento, he reviewed them and he says, oh Maria, you should add some addendum for uh, teachers to not only to have the facilitated dialogue for the community, but also for the school teachers. So I'm working still because of the government shutdown. I'm a little delayed in providing that addendum on national standards, but the, the, the resource is already ready. And I um, gave it to Susan from the Hagen Museum, so she already has it. Ron Rohovit is going to use it for um, in-service credit teachers next week here in the museum. Also, I'm still developing some activities um, that look at portraiture uh, and how portraiture can tell stories. Uh, we have an activity uh, created by the National Portrait Gallery that will be included in a Smithsonian Learning Lab platform uh, where you will see uh, images of Dolores, her life in the farm workers movement and interviews that we've done at the Smithsonian will be there. It's a little web, it's a, like a Pinterest collection of images, audio resources and some um, activities that um, I'm still finishing up and, and reviewing for teachers and the museums that will host um, the exhibition. And I have the honor to introduce you to my fellow, uh, Christina Sar, who's an animal musicologist from Berkeley, and she worked on the farm workers' uh, music activity. So it will be on the website of Smithsonian Folkways and also on the Smithsonian Learning Lab platform. So it's a labor of love and uh, hope that teachers will be able to learn more about Dolores through our um, activities, the community engagement resource, the app, and the little documentary video by Harvey Wilson Richards. So all of that will be available. Yes. Learning Lab, yes. There are already some resources on Dolores Huerta. If you go and um, um, look for the Smithsonian Learning Lab, and you go to search Dolores Huerta, you will find a lot of resources, but the resources that um, are related to this exhibition are still in the works and will be published very soon. Yeah, so thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We have a question here. Oh, sorry. Um, there's uh, and then here. Sorry. I would like to thank you very much on behalf of the Royal Chicano Air Force uh, for acknowledging us and um, 
we have always been the group that has welcomed, you know, uh, whenever there's uh, anything going on in, in Sacramento and uh, people need to be fed or people need to be housed or, you know, especially, and whether it's uh, five farm workers or 55,000 farm workers, the Royal Chicano Air Force has always been here. Uh, Dolores, because it's a history event, just want to uh, bring out that Dolores has been a lifetime member of the Royal Chicano Air Force. And so, Viva Dolores Huerta! I would just like to um, think that uh, all the UCs, especially Davis, Berkeley, and UC Merced, go have this exhibition there because recently, um, because especially UC Merced, because of the farm workers and Gallo. And I would like to see Gallo do Sponsorship. <laughs> and I am actually connected to that somehow, and I'd like to see some kind of exhibition for Dolores. Because recently I came across Latinos that didn't really know anything about Dolores Huerta, and that was kind of shocking to me. And um, I think the universities. Are the, are the bloodline of education, especially here in California. So I'd like to see that. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be um, soon, well, not so soon, in 2021, and uh, in Bakersfield, in the college in Bakersfield, so in the art gallery. So that's a good um, place to be, Bakersfield, the hometown of Dolores and her family and her foundation. Tain, is something maybe a, a little more personal from you that I'd like to ask you about it. I don't know if you've given thought to, uh, well, something that Dolores said during the presentation this morning about making change, not history. Um, and you, you mentioned you were not even a twinkle in the eyes of your parents uh, when all this was happening. They weren't even married. Um, and all this is about uh, perhaps change in this generation of people. The reason we do this um, kind of work is to make change. And I'm wondering on the personal level, if you have reflected on what change has occurred within you, who you are, the nature of your work, the, uh, how you see the world, your politics, your anything like that that has changed because you've spent years working on the life of uh, Dolores uh, and her work. Can you talk something maybe personally about how it's affected you? Wow. Thank you for that question. Well, I... Um, as I said, I'm an art historian, and I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I grew up there, and um, I, at some point, took a course on New Yorican literature, and I didn't know there was such a thing as New Yorican literature, and that class changed my life and led me to want to study the art of the Puerto Rican diaspora, the art of New Yorkans, and then when I was studying that in grad school, I also started discovering the connections with the art of Chicanos, with the Chicano movement, and all of that said, I never imagined that I would be 
you know, when I finished my PhD working at a history museum, at a museum of history and art, doing a history show on a major figure, a major historical figure of this incredible historical moment that I, that I was so interested in because it was such a turning point in the 20th century, the 60s and the 70s. And, and even though I wasn't around, I was just fascinated by the culture of protest, uh, by the counterculture, by people going against the mainstream, by people affirming their identities, which had been suppressed. Uh, and I think that came from a certain um, cultural and political awareness that I was raised with, um, named Taina in honor of the Taino Indians that inhabited Puerto Rico before the Spaniards arrived. And so um, working on this exhibition was just amazing. It's been really transformative. Um, it's really interesting to do uh, research from books, you know, uh, and as, as scholars, we do lots of it. But then to go to the archive, you know, of course, I had read about farm worker exploitation. Yes, and you sort of read it and you're like, sure, yes, uh-huh, of course, yes. But then you go to the archive. I, when I went to the Wayne State Archive and I saw the letters reporting on the conditions of farm workers and saying this person had an accident at work in the field and now no one can support their family and they have no uh, accident insurance, injury you know, insurance, or they're being paid you know, peanuts, or the archival aspect and the um, accumulation of documents attesting to a certain reality was just shaking. And I, it just gave me another perspective on the incredible work of the UFW, of Cesar Chavez, of Dolores Huerta, also of Larry Itliong. I didn't know anything about the Filipino aspect of the movement. I didn't know that the movement was really multicultural. And there's a wonderful interview that Dolores Huerta did several years ago with the Museum of American History, another Smithsonian Museum, where she talks about the Puerto Rican the workers, about the Oki workers, about the Yemeni workers in the UFW. So uh, the experience really provided me a much broader optic into this moment, into this movement, and into what individuals who want to make change can do if they really have that purpose and if they start strategizing and if they let them, if they let that energy move them and move others. Um, and I think I'm gonna take that lesson with me forever, really. Hi. Um. First, I'd like to thank the Smithsonian and the California Museum for such a wonderful display. Uh, and it's an honor to be in the presence of Dorothy, and I loved her presentation this morning. Dolores, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm nervous with the mic. Um, my question is mostly directed towards Dolores. Uh, this morning in your presentation, you were talking about the empowerment of women and the movement, how far it's come along, as you can see in our Congress today, uh, which is great. My question is, that's bothered me since I watched the movie, and when you fought so hard for this movement and you gave up your life and you know you sacrificed yourself and your children and your family and then when Cesar passed away and you would think typically as co-founder that you would step into the uh, chairman or president's 
position, but you were overlooked. Do you feel that was because of the times uh, and as unions were getting more politicized that you were stepped by over uh, due to discrimination or uh, yeah, I guess discrimination is a good word. Thank you. Uh, not really. Uh, I think uh, for those of you that have seen the documentary, and if you haven't seen it, it's going to be shown here again, uh, so you can see it. Actually, uh, after Sasat passed away, uh, I chose not to run for the presidency of the United Farm Workers. And they did include my statement. I mean, they, they actually shot me or filmed me saying that, but they didn't include it, include it in the movie. I, I think they wanted to make it more dramatic, okay? Uh, and the reason is because... Uh, uh, I felt that uh, Cesar and myself, we had built the foundation, and other people, many of, of you who are here in the audience, uh, had built the foundation of, of, of the organization. You know, we passed the Agricultural Relation, Relations Labor Law. Uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, a process where farm workers could organize. We had set up the health plan. We set up the pension plan. Uh, we set up a, a membership structure and a governance structure, uh, how to run... Uh, the contracts, all that was done. Uh, so uh, I just felt that you had to pass it on to younger leadership. And I didn't know how old I was, <laughs> how long I was going to live. I was uh, 63 years old when Caesar passed away. And I didn't know how long I was going to live. And I felt that you had to pass it on to younger leadership uh, to carry the union forward. So I chose not to run. Also, I, I was very involved in the feminist movement at that point. Uh, just before Caesar passed away, I had taken a leave of absence from the union, and uh, we had gone through the country getting women to run for office. In that year, uh, in 1992, we had uh, the largest number of women ever elected to the California State Legislature. And so we wanted to continue that, and so I didn't feel that if I took the presidency of the union, I could continue doing my feminist work, which, which I thought was very important. And also, as, as I said before, I thought we needed younger leadership. And that's why I supported Arturo Rodriguez uh, to become the president. I did stay with the union for nine years after, after Caesar passed away. And left, finally, I ended up leaving in, uh, uh, I guess, 2012? When did I, when did I leave? <laughs> you know, I, so I, you know, I, it's been 16 years since I left the United Farm Workers to start my own foundation. And, and Caesar and I had actually talked about going back uh, to doing grassroots community organizing. Uh, and unfortunately, he passed away before that could happen. But uh, that was uh, something that he and I had both talk, talked about. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I left in 2002. I mean, 2012. In 2003. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, unfortunately, we're out of time for more questions. One more. One last question. I'll make this brief. I may have missed it, but this is for Dolores, please. Did you have an aha moment that I've got to get involved or did it just happen to you gradually? How did you get, what was the impetus for your start in the, in the movements? That question is for Dolores Huerta. Yes, right. Was there an aha moment for you to get involved and do something about all the wrongs that you, you saw happening with the farm workers, or did this gradually happen? Yeah, my, my, aha, mo my aha moment uh, to become an organizer was when I met Fred Ross Sr. And he organized myself uh, and uh, two other people, there were three of us in a house meeting, and uh, I guess I was the only one that really got hooked in that house meeting. Uh, when I learned that you could actually make changes if you just got people together and, and you took action. And that was my aha moment. And so I, 
I worked for the community service organization as a volunteer for about five years before I was ever hired on staff. And it was in that organization, uh, uh, as Taina was just uh, mentioning, that I met Cesar. And he had his aha moment the first uh, time that he met uh, Fred Ross Sr. in a house meeting. And that's the way that we continue to organize. And with house meetings, we just meet in people's homes with maybe uh, four or five people, uh, six to eight. And then we tell them about how they can make changes in their own community. And uh, so you find other people that have those aha moments that they can do it, right? That they can make changes. And it's, it's, it's really very simple, but it just, it's very time consuming, consuming and tedious. But this is the way that we organize. And it still works. But uh, like I say, it does take time uh, to, to get people uh, involved. And there are many people out there that want to do things, but they just don't know how to do it. And so this is what we try to do is reach as many people as possible and capture uh, and all of those that want to get involved. It's, 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 it, the aha moment is a si se puede moment. <laughs> okay. Before our brilliant doctor goes, I have one more question for her. And I want to know, um, what was your takeaway after getting to work with this legend? What's something that, what was an aha moment for you? Like, wow, I didn't know she... <laughs> Well, I didn't, I didn't know she really is someone who deserves to be in history books, mm. who's, who deserves to be known by every single American, who deserves to be known by everyone who calls themselves a feminist, by mm -hmm. everyone who calls themselves a labor rights activist, a human rights activist. Dolores Huerta is up there with Gandhi, with mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King, with Cesar mm -hmm. Chavez, with, you know, she is just that person. And she is, you've seen her right here, she is, um, it's not history, it's history, but then it's history in the making too. She's mm -hmm. working every single day. Uh, she, you know, something incredibly powerful about curating this exhibition is that, yes, I did all that archival research and that was incredible, but when you work, um, with Dolores Huerta, um, you can not only be at the library and the archive. She mm -hmm. takes you to the fields. She, on, on the day when it's 115 degrees, so that you have an idea of how it feels, that scorching sun. You know, she uh, says, okay, come to my foundation tonight. Um, the youth program will be there and you will learn about what they're doing so that you know that she is still following the principles she le learned with Fred Ross Sr. to organize young leaders and to teach them organizing skills so that they can teach others. It's quite incredible. Beautiful, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Caragol, you're amazing. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Wow. thank you for all you did to make this what it is. And thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, please, if you haven't seen the exhibit, it's on the second floor, and we're gonna take a very short break before we screen the 2017 award-winning documentary, Dolores. Only one word needed for a movie title. You're a legend. That'll be at two o'clock. So thanks again, everyone. Si se puede. Thank you. Thank you.